Um, good afternoon. Um, very uh, pleased to be here. And I realized that so many of the other talks today have actually said a lot of the things that I was going to say, so this might actually turn out to be shorter. But part of this is philosophical because I'm really privileged to be at a wonderful hospital where we have a depth of specialists um, in many fields and a tradition of interdisciplinary care, not just for EB, but for several other um, diseases where there where it's needed so that we're very lucky to have the infrastructure and support to be able to do this but I think interdisciplinary care is something that as a parent you can elicit by knowing what the elements are what you want for your child and then trying to put it together at your own institution and um, every institution ours included has strong spots and weak spots, and you just have to look and see where you, uh, where you can get the best care for your child. So I always, I, so many of you have seen this little cartoon, traditional care has been, there's one provider, one doctor, and one child and family. And I think the next step, and this might sound like wordsmithing, but I think philosophically it's very important, is multidisciplinary care. And in multidisciplinary care, there are many problems and many providers. I think that's important because a lot of clinics will call themselves multidisciplinary, but what we really like to emphasize is interdisciplinary. And the difference between the two is that in interdisciplinary care, not only do the providers talk to the family and the child, but they talk to each other. And I think that makes a huge difference for us as well as for the families. Uh, I know in our team over the last oh, six or eight years that we've been together, we've all learned a lot from each other and all feel very comfortable and understand what the other person has done, which is why some of my colleagues have given half of my talk today. <laughs> but. Um, the model has different places where it could be executed. In the outpatient setting, what we like to do is to have patients come to one location and to see several providers. Now this is a very long visit, it's three or four hours usually, but it is, we think, a better model than going around to eight or ten different doctor's offices on separate days and separate times and getting it all together. However, there are some problems that patients may be scheduled a day or two prior to the visit or after the visit because there are doctors who have toys, like ophthalmologists and dentists. They don't like to leave the offices and leave their toys behind. So we really, they need their specialized equipment um, in order to examine your child. So we still do communicate and with, with them, if not on that very day, but they're very, it's very important that um, they be part of the team and that we have designated people who are comfortable and experienced. Following our traditional clinic visit, we have a conference in which all the providers discuss each patient and develop an assessment of needs and then an, what we call an integrated care plan so that we don't necessarily have to agree with each other, but we do like to at least know that we're not telling someone give one dose of the drug and someone else is saying give a different dose of the drug and to try and iron out any you know, little discrepancies. But if there are two opinions, you would get Dr. A says this, Dr. B says that opinion. We also feel that having a written document um, which is sent both to the family, to the referring doctors, to all the other providers, and be kept in the medical records is very important and something that you might ask for if you're at a um, doctor's visit or somewhere and say, could I be included on the medical records that are sent out so that you have a good history of everything that's happened to your child. 
Now on the inpatient service, we also try, um, you know, patients will have to come in for elective procedures or sometimes for medical problems when things are worsening. And in the, just the last few years, we have, along with a national trend to provide expert hospitalist care, we now have several dedicated pediatricians who are hospitalists, which means they don't have offices where they see outpatients, but strictly work in the hospital. And there are many of them, but we have now a select number who will admit all of the patients with EB. So that if someone comes back repeatedly to our hospital, they will meet the same doctors over and over. And it also helps because there are many hospitalists who may never have heard of EB since they were in medical school. And I, it gets to be very tedious to have to explain every time you go in to another team of doctors exactly what the, your child's needs are. So this has been very helpful to us and I think it's an area where hospitalists are now appearing in most medical centers to emphasize maybe we need to get a subspec another um, subspecialty of EB, which is the EB hospitalist. When someone comes in, we try, and it's a little more awkward, but we do try to get all the specialists and the other team members together to decide on a plan of care in the hospital, similar to the outpatient model, but so we can be most efficient and get whatever has to be done accomplished. Um, I think Dr. Whitkugel talked about the operating room and the recovery room are prepared with a lot of um, procedures to cater to the special needs of the EB patient. And if you're somewhere that doesn't have that, you might be able to share with your doctors, well, you know, my, my child needs to have something soft and my child needs to have Vaseline on the sheets, et cetera, et cetera, and to keep yourself a checklist of the things that you would do at home to try and protect your child. And I think most times um, the hospitals are extremely grateful to get your input. And I think the last part of it, we have outpatient, we have inpatient surgery, and that is follow up and this really is a function of our EB nurse specialists who are the primary contact for our families because for our center which is a referral center most of our patients don't live in Cincinnati so we are on the phone a lot parents with nurses and then triage to whichever other specialist they need to talk to I spend a lot of time talking to your physicians at home so that the people at home who are actually taking care of your child are, we're all on the same page. And um, that is, is another piece of it that you can ask your doctors, well, could you make sure you get back to my family doctor or my pediatrician when I get home? These are the subspecialties that we have at Cincinnati Children's, and I think depending on the type of EB or what your child has, you, you may or may not need these. And what I thought I would do is just run through and say, what are the examples of kinds of problems in each of these specialties you may run into and, and need? Dermatology and nursing really is for two things, patient education and support, especially our new families who've never heard of EB. and um, you know, our basics, avoiding tape, handling gently, and remembering the inside of the mouth as much as the skin, getting the right feeding, the right nipples, so that the babies can feed with the least amount of trauma. And I, I put this picture up because this child came from another hospital where you can clearly see two strips of tape that were used um, initially before anyone had any idea of what to do. Um, over the years, we try to work with our patients to teach wound care, to promote healing, and I must confess that actually, I think our role is to steal all of your ideas, and we learn a whole lot more from you than we teach you, and we do pass them on to everybody else. So um, we do learn a tremendous amount from our patients. I don't think there's any two families that I take care of that 
do wound care the same way. And I'm a big advocate of the idea that there is really no wrong way to do it as long as you use common sense and to give people the strength when somebody comes in dogmatically and says this is what you must do and this is the way to do it to realize well wait for my child it's better if I do it another way but we've had some wonderful creative um, methods of wound care that I've learned from all of you over the years bathing and cleansing again uh, there's an art there's no one way to do it and then of course bandaging for protection from trauma and we can serve to provide information about different kinds of bandaging different products clothing shoes diapers for the little ones and we usually keep a repository of that information um, prevention and treatment of infection is something else in our um, it's very important so, important, so the choice of dressings is important. The whole concept of colonization versus infection. Eventually, when the skin is open, it gets colonized with bacteria, and usually some form of staph and some form of pseudomonas. And, but it doesn't mean that if you culture something, it's an infection. And I think some of your physicians at home might worry that every time they culture the skin, they have to be treated with antibiotics. We worry so much about resistance to antibiotics that we often have to make these conscious decisions. Well, when do we use topical therapy? When do we use systemic therapy? When do we use antibiotics? When do we use antiseptics? And we do recommend a lot of things on, on bathing, such as chlorine, bleach, or vinegar. In terms of the hands, we work with our occupational therapists about wrapping to prevent contractures and fusion, and then decide with surgeons, as Dr. Stern showed you this morning, that is a definitely a joint decision between the surgeons and the families and, and our decision, because we see it, the patients first, what kind of surgery and when it's appropriate. We have um, wonderful nutritionists and um, gastroenterologists on the team, and I think that's a, some, something that you should look for. We look at height, weight, and also um, BMI, body mass index, and that really gives an idea, basically, it's a, a measurement of your weight for your particular body mass or height, height sort of height. Um, and using that, you can get better predictions about when you might need a th esophageal dilatation or gastrostomy. And I know that my colleague, Dr. Zizkan, will talk to you tomorrow, and sometimes he would even skip a barium swallow because our families know when they need a dilatation. And this, for example, is a little graph where if you look on the left curve, you'll see height and weight. And you'll see if you look, it, it all kind of looks okay. But if you look over to the right side where that arrow is, if you look at the BMI, you'll see that you get to a certain point and the BMI is only barely on the, on the curve, which means that something happened. The height kept going, but the weight didn't keep up and the child was too thin. And that was a good time to say, we need a gastrostomy. And I don't think we would have gotten the information just looking at the height and weight curves. So um, having the nutritionists with us is really important. Um, nutritionists can counsel you on appropriate food choices, supplements, formulas, and adequate caloric intake and balanced. On the other end, we have constipation, which is another problem, and we also monitor for osteoporosis. Now, there are some tremendous psychological aspects to good nutrition that we've seen, and we have a psychologist, and I'll talk a little more about what the psychologist can do on a team, and that is some of our patients have aversions to eating, fear of gastrostomy, refusal to use a gastrostomy that's put in place. And then, unfortunately, we have some older patients who get into a situation of chronic pain and substance abuse, which also promotes a very poor appetite. So I think there are a lot of other factors that we try to look at along with our nutritionist. 
I think a hematologist, oncologist, who is familiar with EB is important because of the anemia that Dr. Bruckner talked about so well today, and we um, talked about iron deficiency and infusions and transfusions, and unfortunately some of our patients will develop squamous cell carcinoma, and we want to be aware um, to detect it and treat it appropriately. Cardiologists help us out, and we do think it's a good idea because at least at this time, we don't really understand how to predict who is at risk for cardiomyopathy. Selenium and carnitine are well known, but we don't know if that is the, the etiology in, in, in EB, and so our, um, we actually have a very active cardiology group that's trying to look more carefully at whether what predictors there are. And cardiomyopathy is rare, but it's serious enough that we like to have someone look at it. We actually now have a pediatric gynecologist, and um, we do find because of nutritional problems a lot of delayed puberty, and there's estrogen replacement. Some of our boys with delayed puberty will at a certain age do well with testosterone replacement. But we also need the gynecologist to help reduce menstrual blood loss, which contributes to anemia, um, and also can be locally very destructive to the um, whole mucosa down there, and then also provide contraceptive uh, contraception and counseling for some of our sexually active or pregnant patients. And um, so, we have added a, a gynecologist. We have so many surgeons, I don't know what to do with them all, but <laughs> our general surgeons um, are involved with esophageal dilatation, feeding gastrostomy, IV access. If we have squamous cell carcinoma, we need excision and grafting. The hand surgeons do hand release. Dr. Ellerow is going to talk to you about the role of the ear, nose, and throat doctor, and then we also have foot deformities that develop. So I think um, we, you know, part of your team, wherever you are, should include whatever surgeon you might you might need. Um, Dr. Whitfield will already talk to you about the operative procedures and the whirlpool debridement, but we also have pain control and it is a branch of anesthesia, a specialized branch. Dr. Goldschneider is actually in charge of our um, EB pain control. So you may want to inquire about that as well. I talked about the hospitalist care, which we find now is very important. And occupation and physical therapy, they're going to be next on the program. So I think they will tell you, but um, we want to prevent rather than treat. Um, radiologists, and it's nice to have radiologists again familiar. For example, barium swallows are traditionally, as technicians are taught, the pictures start at the shoulder and go down looking at swallowing. Most of our kids with recessive dystrophic EB have their strictures above the shoulder in the neck. And so it's really important to have your team working together so that the radiologists know to do special views, including the neck, otherwise you miss the strictures. So they're pretty good at that, and then the, they work with the surgeons and sometimes actually do the procedures for hydrostatic balloon dilatation. And then in our, our patients with squamous cell carcinoma, variety of MRI, CT, and, and PET scans. Uh, we need pathologists. Now, we don't have a specific pathologist at our hospital, but we've had um, a very good collaboration with Stanford that has an excellent dermatopathology unit that does in immunofluorescence and electron microscopy, as Dr. Paller talked about this morning, and then the genetic mutation analysis. Um, again, you want to find there's just one lab in this country that does it commercially. And we're hoping by the next year or so, we will be also able to offer a, um, another kind of screen for genetic disease. But again, you need to know or find out where to send it so that you get the correct um, diagnosis. 
Um, again, Dr. Power talked to you about the genetics of EB and the, the counseling for family planning, so we need that. Dentists, especially injunctional EB, prophylactic hygiene, cavities, crowding, and enamel problems. Uh, there are a fair number of patients, and we have on call a guest, uh, someone for genitourinary disease, a urologist, and renal problems, as well as ophthalmology, which many of our patients have good ophthalmologists at home who are, are very, and very uh, competent, and I think we're going to hear later uh, tomorrow from Dr. Cantor about the role of the ophthalmologist in, in EB. Um, we have a psychologist, and many of our children, especially as they get older, really benefit from some kind of counseling, um, but help with family dynamics, behavior modification, especially around issues like itching, adolescent adjustment, um, anxiety, pain, depression, and unfortunately a fair number of suicidal thoughts that sometimes occur in some of our older children and again drug and alcohol addiction which are, are pitfalls in any child with chronic disease so we are very we highly encourage people and, and our psychologist really her job is to find good therapy and counseling close to home um, social services help with financial issues, school adjustment, career counseling, and then in the hospital, both outpatient and inpatient, we have child life specialists who we always called play ladies, who do bring movies and games and distraction for minor procedures or just waiting between doctors or waiting for their things, which really helps a visit a great deal. So we do try to anticipate problems by having routine blood tests every six to 12 months, um, which we also have echocardiograms and bone mineral density scans about once a year, trying to anticipate problems and not waiting until they sneak up on us. And, and this, again, is something that if your center or your doctor is not doing, you can ask for. These are the members of our team who are physically in the clinic. It gets a little cozy in our one small conference room, but um, we do need a traffic director who's our coordinator, Donna, who has to tell everyone, well, you go in this room, you go in this room, you go in that room. But in an interdisciplinary clinic, it amazingly all seems to come together at the end of the day. And then we have these specialists on call for either coming down to our clinic or making additional appointments in their office. And these are the same list that we basically just went through. And these are some of the people that you may see. Um, some of them will be here who actually fill in the blanks of those little cartoons. I just wanted to talk a little bit about interdisciplinary in a, in a larger context, and that is the internet has really made communication, worldwide communication. And there are two excellent websites for professionals um, that are up here. One is sponsored by Deborah International. The other was started by the Society for Pediatric Dermatology, um, where professionals can get on and ask questions of each other and share their ideas. The two sites now cooperate so that all members get two emails, maybe the same email, because they send the queries to both sites. So that you can rest assured if your doctor says, oh, I don't know, maybe I'll talk to my colleagues, that there's the advantage of having you know, literally dozens, if not hundreds of providers out there who can talk to each other. And this is really, I think, uh, sort of an extension of the whole idea of communication between physicians. 
Now, similarly, there are efforts underway for collaborative ventures to gather data and to do clinical trials in EB centers across the globe, and there is one called the EB Clinical Research Cooperative um, Consortium and the other EB ClinNet in the North and South America and in Europe. So again, sort of behind the scenes for you, you, the providers are trying to get together to make some sense and order if every center has 10 patients and there are 10 centers, we now have 100 patients, we have a lot more, um, we, we get a lot better data so that we can come out with better answers. So this was just my cartoon idea that the future really relies on communication, global communication. And I really have to say that the major um, thanks I have are to our patients um, because they're the ones who tell us what we need to be doing and how we can do best to at least improve quality of life till our colleagues in the, uh, in the laboratory come up with the cure. Thank you. I think that's individual. Some of the little babies kick their legs and they kick them together, but there are little kind of baby bathtubs that have separators for legs. So I think it's personal preference. You could probably take a pole and some people unwrap and some people don't. Some people do one limb at a time. Some people immerse the whole baby. It, it really depends on what works for you and what other equipment you might have. Yes. I will have to look it up and, and if you just email us, I will get it for you because I don't have it on the top of my head. Thank you. Um, we usually use something like a half to a quarter of a cup of chlorine bleach in a full tub of water. And we have another formula for smaller amounts. Whatever has been published in the, there have been some publications for eczema. This thing, but this is a good question, thank you. Any other questions at this time? Yes. Yeah. Suggestions on what type of soap? Again, there are many good mild soaps, and I think it's personal preference. I, I don't think there are probably two people in this room who use the same soap, um, and, and a lot of them work. Do you, do you have something special that you like? Just asking about soap that doesn't cause pain on the skin or itching. Oh, again, personal. Does anyone have a wonder soap that they'd like to suggest? Yeah. We didn't hear what that was. I was asking her if she tried to get a cleanser. And it doesn't sting me at all, but I know some people it does sting. Yeah, which is a chlorhexidine. So there, there are many, as I say, I'm sure if, you, if, you, if we went around and forced you to say it, everyone would have their, their favorite. We don't have one in particular. Um, 